one, two, Stella Zihandela, Japara, May 25th, 1899. I have been longing to make the acquaintance of a modern girl, that proud, independent girl who has all my sympathy. She who, happy and self-reliant, lightly and alertly steps on her way through life, full of enthusiasm and warm feeling, working not only for her own well-being and happiness, but for the greater good of humanity as a whole. I glow with enthusiasm toward the new time which has come, and can truly say that in my thoughts and sympathies, I do not belong to the Indian world, but to that of my pale sisters who are struggling forward in the distant West. If the laws of my land permitted it, there is nothing that I had rather do than give myself wholly to the working and striving of the new woman in Europe. But age-long traditions that cannot be broken hold us fast cloistered in their unyielding arms. Some day those arms will loosen and let us go, but that time lies as yet far from us, infinitely far. It will come, that I know. It may be three, four generations after us. Oh, you who do not know what it is to love this young, this new age with heart and soul, and yet to be bound hand and foot, chained by all the laws, customs, and conventions of one's land. All our institutions are directly opposed to the progress for which I so long for the sake of our own people. Day and night I wonder by what means our ancient traditions could be overcome. For myself, I could find a way to shake them off, to break them, were it not that other bond, stronger than any age-old tradition could ever be, binds me to my world. And that is the love which I bear for those to whom I owe my life, and whom I must thank for everything. Have I the right to break the hearts of those who have given me nothing but love and kindness my whole life long? and who have surrounded me with the tenderest care. But it was not the voices alone which reached me from that distant, that bright, that newborn Europe, which made me long for a change in existing conditions. Even in my childhood, the word emancipation enchanted my ears. It had a significance that nothing else had, a meaning that was far beyond my comprehension, and awakened in me an ever-growing longing for freedom and independence, a longing to stand alone. Conditions both in my own surroundings and in those of others around me broke my heart and made me long with a nameless sorrow for the awakening of my country. Then the voices which penetrated from distant lands grew clearer and clearer till they reached me, and to the satisfaction of some who loved me, but to the deep grief of others, brought seed which entered my heart, took root, and grew strong and vigorous. And now I must tell you something of myself, so that you can make my acquaintance. I am the eldest of the three unmarried daughters of the regent of Japara, and have six brothers and sisters. What a world, eh? My grandfather, Pangaran Aryo Chondronegoro of Demak, was a great leader in the progressive movement of his day, and the first regent of Middle Java to unlatch his door to that guest from over the sea, Western civilization. All of his children had European educations. All of them have, or had, several of them are now dead, a love of progress inherited from their father. And these gave to their children the same upbringing which they themselves had received. Many of my cousins and all my older brothers have gone through the Hugri Burger School, the highest institution of learning that we have here in India, and the youngest of my three older brothers has been studying for three years in the Netherlands, the two and two others are in the service of that country. We girls, so far as education goes, fettered by our ancient traditions and conventions, have profited but little by these advantages. It was a great crime against the customs of our land that we should be taught at all, and especially that we should leave the house every day to go to school. 
for the custom of our country forbade girls in the strongest manner ever to go outside of the house. We were never allowed to go anywhere, however, save to the school, and the only place of instruction of which our city could boast, was, which was open to us, was a free grammar school for Europeans. When I reached the age of twelve, I was kept at home. I had to go into the box. I was locked up and cut off from all communication with the outside world, toward which I might never turn again save at the side of a bridegroom, a stranger, an unknown man whom my parents would choose for me, and to whom I should be betrothed without even my knowledge. European friends, this I heard later, had tried in every possible way to dissuade my parents from this cruel course toward me, a young and life-loving child. But they were able to do nothing. My parents were inexorable. I went into my prison. Four long years I spent between thick walls, without once seeing the outside world. How I passed through that time, I do not know. I only know that it was terrible. But there was one great happiness left me. The reading of Dutch books and correspondence with Dutch friends was not forbidden. This, the only gleam of light in that empty, somber time, was my all, without which I should have fallen, perhaps, into a still more pitiable state. My life, my soul even, would have been starved. But then came my friend and my deliverer, the spirit of the age. His footsteps echoed everywhere. Proud, solid, ancient structures tottered to their foundation at his approach. Strongly barricaded doors sprang open, some as of themselves, others only painfully halfway, but nevertheless they opened and let in the unwelcome guest. At last, in my sixteenth year, I saw the outside world again. Thank God! Thank God! I could leave my prison as a free human being and not chained to an unwelcome bridegroom. Then events followed quickly that gave back to us girls more and more of our lost freedom. In the following year, at the time of the investiture of our young princess, our parents presented us officially with our freedom. For the first time in our lives, we were allowed to leave our native town and to go to the city where the festivities were held in honor of the occasion. What a great and priceless victory it was. That young girls of our position should show themselves in public was here an unheard of occurrence. The world stood aghast. Tongues were said wagging at the unprecedented crime. Our European friends rejoiced. And as for ourselves, no queen was so rich as we. But I am far from satisfied. I would go still farther, always further. I do not desire to go out to feasts and little frivolous amusements that has never been the cause of my longing for freedom. I long to be free, to be able to stand alone, to study, to not be subject to any one, and above all, never, never to be obliged to marry. But we must marry, must, must. Not to marry is the greatest sin which the Muslim woman can commit. It is the greatest disgrace which a native girl can bring to her family. And marriage among us? Miserable is too feeble an expression for it. How can it be otherwise, when the laws have made everything for the man and nothing for the woman? When law and convention both are for the man, when everything is allowed to him? Love? <laughs> what do we know here of love? How can we love a man whom we have never known? And how could he love us? That in itself would not be possible. Young girls and men must be kept rigidly apart and are never allowed to meet. I am anxious to know of your occupations. It is all very interesting to me. I wish to know about your studies. I would know something of your Toynbee evenings and of the Society for Total Abstinence of which you are so zealous a member. Among our Indian people, we have not the, de the drink demon to fight, thank God. But I fear, I fear that when once, forgive me, your Western civilization shall have obtained a foothold among us, 
we shall have that evil to contend with too. Civilization is a blessing, but it has its dark side as well. The tendency to imitate is inborn, I believe. The masses imitate the upper classes, who in turn imitate those of higher rank, and these again follow the Europeans. Among us there is no marriage feast without drinking, and at the festivals of the natives, where they are not of strong religious convictions, and usually they are Muslim only because their fathers, grandfathers, and remote ancestors were Muslim, in reality they are little better than heathen. Large square bottles are always kept standing, and they are not sparing in the use of these. But an evil greater than alcohol is here, and that is opium. Oh. The misery, the inexpressible horror it has brought to my country. Opium is the pest of Java. Yes, opium is far worse than the pest. The pest does not remain forever. Sooner or later it goes away. But the evil of opium, once established, grows. It spreads more and more, and it will never leave us, never grow less. For to speak plainly, it is protected by the government. The more general the use of opium in Java, the fuller the treasury. The opium tax is one of the richest sources of income of the government. What matter if it go well or ill with the people? The government prospers. This curse of the people fills the treasury of the Dutch East Indian government with thousands, nay, with millions. Many say that the use of opium is no evil, but those who say that have never known India, or else they are blind. What are our daily murders, incendiary fires, robberies, but the direct result of the use of opium? True, the desire for opium is not so great and evil as long as one can get it, when one has money to buy the poison, but when one cannot obtain it, when one has no money with which to buy it, and is a confirmed user of it, then one is dangerous. Then one is lost. Hunger will make a man a thief, but the hunger for opium will make him a murderer. There is a saying here, At first you eat opium, but in the end it will devour you. It is terrible to see so much evil and to be so powerless to fight against it. That splendid book by Mevro Gukup I know. I have read it three times. I could never grow tired of it. What would I not give to be able to live in Hilda's environment? Oh, that we in India had gone so far that a book could cause such violent controversy among us as Hilda van Suylenburg has in your country. I shall never rest till HVS appears in my own language to do good as well as harm to our own Indian world. It is a matter of indifference, whether good or harm, if it makes but an impression, for that shows that one is no longer sleeping, and Java is still in deep slumber. And how will her people ever be awakened, when those who should serve as examples themselves love sleep so much? The greater number of European women in India care little or nothing for the work of their sisters in the fatherland. Will you not tell me something of the labors, the struggles, the sentiments of the women of today in the Netherlands? We take deep interest in all that concerns the women's movement. I do not know the modern languages, alas. We girls are not allowed by our law to learn languages. It was a great innovation for us to learn Dutch. I long to know languages. Not so much to be able to speak them, as for the far greater joy of being able to read the many beautiful works of foreign authors in their own tongue. Is it not true that never mind how good a translation may be, it is never so fine as the original? That is always stronger, more charming. We have much time for reading, and reading is our greatest pleasure. We, that is, the younger sisters and I, we three have had the same bringing up, and are much with one another. We differ in age, each from the other, but by one year. Among us three there is the greatest harmony. Naturally, we sometimes have little differences of opinion, but that does not weaken the tie that binds us together. Our little quarrels are splendid, I find them so. I love the reconciliations that follow. 
It is the greatest of all lies. Do you not think so, too? That any two human beings can think alike in everything? That cannot be. People who say that must be hypocrites. I have not yet told you how old I am. I was just twenty last month. Strange that when I was sixteen I felt so frightfully old and had so many melancholy moods. Now that I can put two crosses behind me, I feel young and full of the joy of life, and the struggle of life, too. Call me simply Cartini. That is my name. We Javanese have no family names. Cartini is my given name and my family name, both at the same time. As far as Radin Ajing is concerned, those two words are the title. I told Mevro van Wormiskirkin when I gave her my address, not to put Cartini alone. That would hardly reach me from Holland. And as for writing uh, Mijufrov, or something of that kind, I have no right to it. I am only a Javanese. Now for the present, you know enough about me. Is it not so? Another time I shall tell you of our Indian life. If there is any light that you would like thrown upon any of our Indian affairs, please ask me. I am ready to tell you all that I know about my country and my people.